Hi guys, it's Will Nichols here for NatureTTL.com and today I've got 10 tips for you to improve your wildlife photos. I've been writing wildlife photography tutorials over on the main Nature TTL website for a number of years now, but there are always some tips that I find myself coming back to again and again, and that's because they are just so good at improving wildlife photos in an instant. So whether you're just stuck in a bit of a rut and you're uh, trying to improve your pictures, take them to the next level, or whether you're relatively new to photography, hopefully these 10 tips are gonna help you out. So number one, get down low. So this is all about the perspective of your shot and getting down onto the eye level of your subject is really good for introducing impact into your images. So take a look at this red squirrel. Now this is taken from a relatively high angle above its eye level, but if we move the camera down and get onto eye level with the subject, there's immediately a load more impact in the shot. And you feel like as a viewer that you're kind of the same size as that subject. So here are some other pictures where we're on eye level with the subject and you can really see the impact you have, you're drawn into the picture. So getting down low is a really good way of getting rid of that amateur feel to your shots and taking it to the next level. This video is supported by photo insurance specialist PhotoGuard. When disaster strikes and you damage your camera, the price to repair or replace can be high. PhotoGuard take the worry out of repairing or replacing your prized camera, drone or video equipment. Check the link on screen or in the description below to get an instant quote from PhotoGuard. There's also a 10% discount for all subscribers to the Nature TTL channel. Now, on with the video. Tip number two is all about light. Now there are a number of different types of lighting you can take advantage of in wildlife photography. You may well have heard people talking about light before and it is a similar story across all genres of photography because light is key and it can really make all the difference. Now there are three main types of lighting that you'll want to take advantage of. The first is backlighting, second is side lighting, and then of course you've got front lighting as well. So these are just three of the main areas and there are of course lots of different uh, variations on this. But my favorite has got to be backlighting. So look at this bear here. You can see it lit around the edges by some strong backlighting and this is taken with the sun directly behind the subject. And it's great for bringing out all that fur detail Backlighting is easiest to get in the morning or the evening, but you're looking for a really low, unobstructed sun. But it is the perfect way to get this beautiful, warm, golden feel in your shots. Now, side lighting is similar. It's not gonna be in the middle of the day, but it's when your subject is lit from the side, and it is a great way of, again, highlighting uh, some fur and things in, on your subject in a different, slightly different way. Um, but it is great for introducing some contrast into your images as well. Front lighting comes when the sun is looking directly at your subject from the front. And this is a nice way of getting just perfectly clean, well-lit portrait shots. Now, most of the time, and this is not a rule that should be applied all of the time, but most of the time, if you're shooting in the middle of the day, you're gonna have a really harsh sun coming straight from above, introducing horrible shadows and contrasts into your shots. Now, one of the ways to get around this is shoot on a cloudy day, which means the clouds act as a giant diffuser. And this can be really nice, actually, and introduce some very clean, uniform lighting around your subject. Next up is learn about your subject. Now this can make another massive difference to your images. If you actually know about the animal you're shooting, you're able to predict movements, spot when a particular behavior might be about to take place, and it gives you the upper hand, and now you're not just relying on luck all the time. So look at these two gannets courting. Now this is a courtship behavior between two individuals, and knowing about the animal, it happens when one individual comes back to the nest, and it's how they greet each other after they've been away, one of them's been away at sea for a while. So understanding the behavioral routines of these animals helps you anticipate that this potential for a shot is coming, and then you're lined up ready to shoot it in time. You can get in position for the perfect angle. Another really good time that learning about your subject applies is when shooting with birds, for example. So it's not always going to be species specific um, for these things you learn about, but with birds, when they're about to take flight, they'll often start tilting forwards. They might go to the toilet as well, but they, uh, to lose some weight, but they'll lean forwards and you'll see them twitching a bit before they then take flight. So knowing that, gives you the upper hand again when it comes to anticipating the flight movement. So if you're just relying on luck, you're gonna be sitting there waiting, 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 and then suddenly it moves and oh, it's a bit late and you might miss it. Whereas if you know it's about to take flight, you're ready to move the camera with the bird. 
Number four is experiment with shutter speeds. Now it's very easy to get comfortable in the shutter speed you're using. If you're always shooting and freezing motion perfectly to avoid camera shake, etc. Now that's perfectly fine, but it means that you're missing out on some potentially more creative shots. So let's look at this puff in here flying past the camera. Here the slow shutter speed has meant that I can pan with the animal and introduce this motion blur into the shot. It conveys the motion, it conveys the speed of the puffin flying. Now if I was to choose a really fast shutter speed then this picture might be pin sharp, hopefully, um, but that would mean that there was no actual motion in the shot. It would be frozen in time. But a slower shutter speed allows you to introduce a different dynamic into the shot. Number five is to not be afraid of ISO speeds. Now I always say that it's important to have an ISO speed as high as necessary, but as low as possible. Now when you increase your ISO speed, you make the sensor more sensitive to light, but you also introduce digital noise into your image. That's all of the grain you see in the background um, across the shot. And it can ruin your image if it's really, really high. But if you're a wildlife photographer, you're probably shooting in low light, which means that you need to use these higher ISO speeds. So the key thing is to be aware of how your camera responds to these ISO speeds. Different cameras have different capabilities, but don't be afraid of pushing the limits of your camera if it's gonna make the difference between a noisy but sharp shot or a not noisy but completely blurred shot, which is useless really. If you're already comfortable with how your camera responds to different ISO speeds, then when the situation comes that you are photographing an animal, you've got that short window of opportunity, you'll already know what your limit is and how long you can keep shooting for. Next up is always be ready to press the shutter. Now this may seem like a really basic tip, but if you're not ready, you aren't looking down the viewfinder, you don't have your finger on the trigger, you're gonna be missing that shot when the animal does something key, like turning its head, looking towards you, or performing some quick behavior, um, you're gonna miss the image. So if you're not ready and you're not waiting, and it may mean your arms ache if you're always in position waiting to take that picture, but do it because it makes all the difference. Tip number seven is to always keep both eyes open when looking down the viewfinder. Now this may seem a little tricky at first and it does take some getting used to, but if you're looking down the viewfinder with your right eye and your left eye is open, that means that you still have the rest of the scene around your subject available to watch. So if you, you don't need to be focused on both at the same time, but if, you, if an animal moves on the left, you're gonna catch that movement in your eye. And it might mean that there are two animals in front of you, say you're in a wildlife hide, for example. If you're focused on one, you might not see another animal approaching. And if those two are about to interact, that could be a great image. But if you don't have that eye open, you're not aware that's gonna happen and you can easily miss the shot. So just get used to it and try both eyes open. Something I love to suggest people try, and it's quite an advanced technique, is to use back button focusing. Now this is where you separate the act of focusing and taking the picture from the shutter button on your camera. So that AF on button on the back of your camera becomes the focus and the shutter only takes a picture. So if you half press the shutter, nothing will happen. But if you fully press it, it takes a picture, whether the image is in focus or not. Now, if you're focusing with your thumb on the back of the camera and your finger on the shutter to take the picture, that means that you're able to utilize all three focusing modes at the same time. That's manual, AFS and AFC, or one shot and servo. Uh, focusing modes. Now if you're able to use all of these at the same time that means you're never going to need to switch focus mode for different situations. So for example you've got an animal in front of you and it stops still on a branch. Now you might want to take a nice portrait shot of it. Now usually if you're just focusing and taking a picture with the shutter button you have to move along, focus on the animal, keeping the shutter half pressed, recompose and then fully press it to take the shot. If you let go and then press it again, unless you've moved that focus point, you're gonna change the focus into the probably the background. Now, if you're on back button focus, you can focus on the animal with the focus button. You, you can let go of that and then you can recompose and take the picture. Now, if the animal starts moving, you can track it, you can hold down that focusing button and you'll continue tracking the animal. Now this has to mean that you're obviously in servo or AFC mode first, but you're able to adapt it. So you're able to use AFC mode as if it was AFS mode, just by letting go of the, the button on the back of the camera. Now you can also use manual focus by not touching AF on at all. And that means that you just move the focus ring and when you press the shutter, the camera doesn't adjust the focus. So there you have manual, AFS or one shot, AFC and servo modes all in one. 
Tip number nine is to always watch your backgrounds. Now, when you're focused on the subject, it can be really easy to not realize what's going on behind the subject. Now, it might be that you take a nice portrait of an animal, but there could be a branch in the background that appears to be coming out of its head or a bright highlight, which is quite distracting. Now, some people will say this is a bit too perfectionist, but if it's a case of moving a couple of feet to the right, it can make all the difference. You could move that highlight away from the animal out of the frame or that branch is no longer intersecting your subject. So always pay attention to the background even if you're shooting at a shallow depth of field because you're still gonna get those distracting shapes and highlights in the shot. My final tip is to put in the time necessary. Now you might think that spending a few hours in a hide is a lot of time, but you'll find that most wildlife photographers are spending hours and hours, day after day, week after week, month after month, or even year after year to properly document and photograph a species in depth. So don't be afraid of putting the time in, even if you're not finding that you're getting many results. It's spending that time and being there for that opportunity when it arises that makes your shots much better than other shots you see. So don't be afraid of spending time and make your own luck. There we have it, these are my 10 top tips for wildlife photography. Hopefully you find these useful, maybe have some of your own tips, so let me know in the comments below. It'll be great to see what you guys think and what kind of things you've learned over the years as photographers as well. And don't forget to subscribe to the Nature TTL YouTube channel. We have weekly videos coming out. That's tutorials, inspirational features, and kit reviews as well. So hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next week.